the most important thing to remember is poverty, as we know it today, is a creation of government. The poor are put out of work by regulations uh, that make it hard for them to get into the workforce, especially as entrepreneurs. And I saw this when I rented to low-income people. I had a couple tenants who were doing sewing in their homes, their apartments, or child care, which was fine with me. But it wasn't fine with the city government. They called me and asked me to evict them. And, and I said, well, what are these people going to do if you shut them down? And they said, well, they should go on welfare. <laughs> That's what they should be doing. And, and actually, they hounded these women so much. I, I, of course, did not evict them. But they hounded them so much that eventually the women said, hey, it's not worth the hassle. We're going to quit what we're doing, and we're going to go on welfare. And they did. Now, how sad. Somebody could support themselves, wanted to support themselves, and were literally pushed out of business by government. And this is the main problem today. That's how poverty is created. When you're, not when you're forced to do it, <laughs> but when the spirit moves you, I, I think a uh, good things come from that for you. And it, it's not that you do it because good things come to you, but it's just a natural outgrowth of, of uh, the compassion, really, that, that most human beings have for others. It's natural. It's natural to love. It's not, it's not something that, even somebody you don't know, I think it's natural to um, have that, quote, universal love. Uh, you might not love them personally, but you wish them well anyway. 4.7 million people have died waiting for drugs that we know are effective because of this 10-year delay on average. This is a lot of people. 25 to 55% of today's healthcare costs are directly related to the loss of innovation that we experience due to the 1962 Kefauver for Harris amendments. That's huge. If you want to bring healthcare costs down, it's easy to do. In fact, the next slide has a quote that I really like by William Wardell, and he says that even one new drug, the stature of penicillin or digitalis, has been unjustifiably banished to a company's back shelf because of these excessive regulatory requirements. That event would harm more people than all of the drug toxicity in the history of modern drug development how these regulations account for 80% or more of current drug costs, have made drugs less safe, have slashed innovation in half, have shortened the lives of about 20% of our population that have died since these things were put in, and have probably doubled general health care costs. You know, you now have to go blind in one eye from, you know, from this macular degeneration before you can get the pharmaceutical drug that will prevent it from happening. Yeah, got to be blind in one eye before it's considered cost-effective to save your other eye. And in most socialized countries, you are not allowed to go buy your own health care. So it means going out of the country. So this is very, very sad. Are there companies that benefit from these regulations? And the answer is, yes, the big companies benefit because the smaller companies are put out of business. You know, you can't take a billion-dollar hit when at the last minute the FDA decides that they're not going to approve your drug unless you're big. So what's happening now in the industry is they're merging. Of course, as they merge, they lay people off, but they're merging and becoming a cartel. You know, basically the monopoly is, is, is starting. And it's become, because the companies can't survive unless they merge. The only way they can get rid of that competition is to patent a different type of drug, maybe slightly different, develop it all over again. Now the thing is, they don't know anything about the side effects of this new drug. So instead of using an older drug where we know the side effects and we know what to be careful with, we start with a new drug where the safety effects are not known, where there's a higher risk that will do something that we don't realize until it's too late. So this is one reason why drugs are less, less safe today is because even if all the drug did was work for another indication, another disease for which it wasn't originally approved for, it's usually cheaper to develop a whole, or it makes more economic sense, I should say. It's not cheaper. It makes more economic sense to start a whole new drug program with a whole new drug rather than use the old one and get an approval for the other disease. Why? Because the patent will run out by the time they get approval for that other disease. So they've got to start all over again so they can have the monopoly protection so they might be able to recover their development costs. Now, I know this sounds kind of convoluted, and it is. 
There's a reason it sounds convoluted. It is. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and once you start understanding how these regulations work against you and drive up health care costs, not just in pharmaceuticals, but every other one, then you realize what the problem with health care is. And then when people come to you and say, well, we need universal health care, you know what to tell them. Universal health care means health care rationing. There's only one way that we can all get the health care we need, and that is to make sure that we have the freedom to get innovation, inexpensive supplements when that's the right answer, breakthrough drugs when it's not, and the only way we're going to do this and keep costs down is get rid of the waste, and all the waste, well, maybe not all of it, but almost all the waste is in the regulatory system. What this shows is that regulators, on average, destroy 150 private sector jobs. And which jobs are they destroying? The entrepreneurial jobs, the small businesses. Why is this bad? Small businesses create about 80% of the jobs. So if we destroy small businesses and entrepreneurs, we are really destroying the wealth-creating engine of our country, which of course is jobs. That's how we create wealth. We have some type of job, even if it's working for another company or working for ourselves. And working for ourselves and having a small firm is the way that most wealth is created in this and other countries. The message I want to leave with you tonight is that poverty can be eliminated. It is universal abundance is well within our grasp. We know the mechanics of how it works. This isn't a guess anymore. It's, it's very clear. And entrepreneurship is the means by which this happens. So obviously, if we want to have universal abundance, and I think that that is something that humankind has longed for, for, for eons, that if we want to have that, we have to let the entrepreneurs do what they do best, create wealth, and get rid of the regulations that are stopping them from doing that. And then, almost automatically, in the emergent order that we saw in the last talk, wealth grows and everyone benefits. That the universal abundance that we have always wanted for the entire world is ours if we just let the entrepreneurs create it. Thank you. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the No Government License. This allows for reuse by anyone except for agents and the gov uh, <laughs> governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at Bipcot.org. So today I am delighted to have Mary Ruwert, Ph.D., uh, in biophysics on the show. Uh, she's coming in from Texas. She is the author of Healing Our World, The Compassion of Libertarianism, um, with a foreword by Ron Paul, no less. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, her other book is Short Answers uh, to the Tough Questions. And uh, you can find her on Facebook. Um, uh, she has a personal page and a fan page uh, under just Mary Ruwert. And her website, main website is ruwert.com. And on her website, you can actually get excerpts for both books as well as a free PDF version of Healing Our World, the uh, 1993 version. So she's not just an evil capitalist like most people think of uh, <laughs> libertarians. <laughs> Amazing, right? Amazing. <laughs> we're actually very kind and generous. So <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about the, those books. Um, really awesome awesome content. I um, and, and also her new book coming out very soon called Death by Regulation, um, How We Were Robbed. Um, she's a She's the queen of subtlety and <laughs> the book about the FDA uh, and also uh, some of the to topics in healing our world, poverty, the environment and healthcare. So, uh, Mary, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. 
Yes, um, I heard you first on um, on Louis Mises on Emancipated Human, and then I saw you on Stefan Molyneux, and oh yeah, you were also on Tom Woods, and and I just love your style, I love your demeanor, I love the way you phrase things, you articulate things. I think there's so many people that um, are very harsh and abrasive when describing these to- topics, and I think that tends to turn a lot of people off who aren't are not that way and they're not you know they're more sensitive they're, and uh, and so and so that's kind of my slant as well so so i really appreciate that <laughs> well sure you know it's interesting we have this wonderful philosophy that gives us universal uh, harmony and abundance if it's practiced and we don't focus on that we focus <laughs> on the things we're doing wrong and i i guess that's the first step when you learn about the non-aggression principle but what i really love about it is that it promises us such a wonderful future and actually a wonderful uh, even present if we are <laughs> if we are able to implement it yes yes i definitely agree you know people tell me um you know how do you guarantee that everyone's going to follow your non-aggression principle <laughs> i didn't sign your non-aggression principle i don't have to follow it and uh, you know, and they say, you know, you're just a utopian. It's never going to happen. Everyone's not going to follow your, your your precious morality rules. And um, and usually, what I respond is, um, you know, number one, you can do what you want, but just suffer the consequences. And and you know, don't try to don't try to throw responsibility on, on anyone else. And and number two, I don't. I'm I'm not an I'm not an anarchist or voluntarist because I think that you know um, there will be a stateless society composed of a free, uh, you know, a voluntary society, um, you know, very soon, but I d- definitely think there will be, but, you know, that's not the main reason. The main reason is because it's based in morality, right? It's based in uh, philosophy. It's a, it's a, it's a humane, it's a compassionate philosophy, live and let live, right? What's more, you know, like, I remember you said once on, on uh, I think it was um, Emancipated Human, you said, you know, you, you're supposed to love your neighbor, and so the loving your neighbor you don't want to steal from your neighbor right you want to let your neighbor <laughs> right. live as they want to live as, as long as they're not hurting anybody and i think that's the essence of uh, voluntarism and well that's right you know and we practice it every day on a one-to-one basis i mean if you and i were neighbors and you know i wouldn't go to your house with a gun in my hand and say you will contribute to my favorite charity or i'll shoot you <laughs> I would never do that and yeah. you wouldn't do that to me and if i threw a baseball through your window i'd you know, restore it. I'd, right. I'd pay restitution. I'd make it right again. You know, that's the second part of the non-aggression principle we don't often talk about, but it's very important. It's how we gauge whether or not we've actually done something, quote, wrong. You know, do we have to restore the person that we hurt? And and normally, of course, we do. And And there's situations where people say, well, you know, you can't be a libertarian because if you were falling off a building and you hung onto this balcony and the person who owned that particular condo came out and said, well, I don't want you hanging out on my balcony. If you're a real libertarian, you have to drop to the ground. No, of course not. <laughs> you, would, you would enter the apartment oh, expecting man. to pay restitution, right? right, right. Um, and, and, of course, even, you know, if, if, if it was unreasonable restitution, then I guess you'd probably take it to court. But... You know, it's it balances everything. Restitution balances everything, and that's something I think a lot of libertarians forget to talk about. I think bringing that into the mix and showing how we actually interact one-to-one with the non-aggression principle. Almost everybody practices the non-aggression principle on a one-to-one basis. It's just that, well, we've had some propaganda that tells us can't do that when you're interacting group-to-group, and so government gets to do a lot of things that we as individuals would find abhorrent if it was done by our neighbors. Right, right. And uh, it's interesting you should bring up those kind of um, hypothetical situations where they say, you know, your principle is flawed because in this very unique situation, you know, if if you... If somebody tells you you have to slap this person to save a thousand lives, would you slap the person? Mm-hmm. And if you did, that would be a violation. <laughs> it would be, but of course, if you if you felt strongly that you were killing another Hitler, you might do it and decide that you would take whatever the consequences were in terms of restitution right. or punishment. There really isn't right. punishment in the libertarian system, uh, so. Mm-hmm. But you know you. You know, you'd be willing to accept that. And you know, if you look through history, you'll find a lot of, a lot of the people that we consider heroes or great teachers did exactly that. 
I mean, Christ let himself be crucified. That was the price he paid for mm. his teachings. Yeah. Now, you may not believe in them or whatever, but he accepted that. And a lot of you see that in a lot of the people who have tried to move uh, humans forward <laughs> in their evolution. It, you know, interesting you bring up restitution uh, because, yeah, when I talk about because you know one of the things that's difficult for people to understand is uh, when when we when we say that the government or the state is an immoral institution and and um, you know sh should be replaced by private agencies. Um, one of the difficult things is uh, courts. They're like, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna have a society without courts and and of course, it's the um, what is that the false dichotomy, right? We're not advocating there's going to be a lack of arbitration. There's just going to be a <laughs> lack of the monopoly on arbitration. The, That's the, right. The monopolistic court system, and so the idea of restitution versus retribution, and what's the difference? And I think that's mm -hmm. a very important uh, distinction. Yes, and you know when when the West was settled, the American West, uh, what you know there was no government out there for many decades. And when people went out there, um, it was actually very peaceful. And you can see the remnants of that peacefulness in that a lot of people out west in the rural areas especially still don't lock their doors. Mm. Right, 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 <laughs> and it right. wasn't so uh, – so Terry Anderson of PERC, um, which is a, a libertarian think tank that focuses on pollution and environment and those types of issues. He wrote a wonderful paper in the Journal of Libertarian Studies called um, The Not-So-Wild Wild West, and now he has a book out on it. And he describes just what you're saying, the courts and everything that evolved in a total, basically an anarchy without government, right. and how they would interact with each other when they had different rules and things. And what you find is it actually worked pretty well. Uh, probably as good or better as it does today. And restitution was a big feature of mm. that. You know, if you polluted uh, a stream and down downstream the cattle were poisoned or the farmers couldn't plant because the water was gone, you know, you paid restitution. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it's very... I like to talk about that concept because um, you know it's, it's it's a big difference between punishing someone for doing something and trying to make the victim whole, right? It's a big difference. That's right. A big, big difference, difference, right? And mm -hmm. and then of course you know you, you, the people understand like you know let's say you know a woman gets mugged and she a hundred dollars gets robbed and so you know the um, the uh, let's say the the courts deem him guilty and then they say you have to pay back one hundred and fifty dollars to to um, restore the person you know emotional damage and loss of work or injury or whatever but then they say well what about a, a, a murder how do you put a how do you put a um um a, a monetary value on that and you're and you're like you're right you can't you can't really but no. but somehow there are ways that um people can solve it without having a one monolithic <laughs> monopoly on the whole thing well yes i mean because right now what happens if you're Let's say your spouse is murdered. Right. Not only do you lose your spouse, you have to pay to incarcerate and try right. the guilty party. And the guilty party should be, of course, paying that in some way. And, and actually, it's very possible to do that. I describe that in, in you know, very detail, much detail in, in healing our world because right. I think it's an important thing to understand. Mm. And there have been lots of instances where people have actually made quite a bit of money in prison with crafts and other things, and <laughs> they've been shut down by the unions and the government. <laughs> so, and and the thing is, if you lost your spouse, of course, probably you'd need, you know, if if the the spouse was the breadwinner, then you would obviously need money, which the uh, murderer could you know, help you out with. Uh, you might need to have psychological help. I mean, that's a big, that's a big hurt. You know, you might want to go to a professional. I mean, so, so money could be involved there. There's a lot of ways in which the murderer can at least um, make up partially for the loss, as opposed to now where you actually not only don't get anything, you have to go through the trial and then you have to pay to incarcerate or execute the person, which is... You know, you get you get to pay multiple times, right? Which is not, of course, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very, very strange thing when uh, 
you're actually paying for the yeah through your taxes, housing, room, and board. <laughs> for us. Yeah, and it's a lot of money. It's about thirty grand a year to you know for one prisoner. Right. And if you execute them, it's even more because they have appeals, and then of course it costs a lot of money to execute them because you have to have certain protocols and. Hmm. Right. Well, you know, that's a whole other story, of course, right. is, you know, should you be able, should right. the state be able to execute right. anybody when they found a lot of people who are innocent on yeah. death row? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let, let me ask you this. I just thought of this. Um, I've been hearing a lot about private prisons, and, and that's one thing that some of my relatives who are more leftist, um, you know, Bernie Sanders supporters, you know, and I talk about free market capitalism, and, and they say, say, these private prisons are just making a profit off of uh, imprisoning people. And that's what you want. You is that what you want? You want people to make a profit off of imprisoning people? And and my response um, is, um, I don't think it, <laughs> if the prison um, is benefiting from state and federal laws, um, I would not call that private <laughs> in any respect. <laughs> uh, so so, uh, uh, but yeah. So um, what what is your what is your uh, response to that? Well, actually, private prisons generally cost less per inmate than public prisons. So even though public prisons don't make what you normally think of as a profit, mm -hmm. what's happening is they're inefficient. And, you know, the people that are working there are probably, at least some of them, are overpaid compared to the private sector. So mm -hmm. do you want to pay? The question is, do you as a taxpayer want to pay more money? for the public prison <laughs> and just have it public. The nice thing about, you know, of course now in a, a libertarian system, what would happen is the prisoner could actually pick the prison. Then hmm. the way that works, of course, is somebody is mistreating people in a particular prison, they just move out. And if they're not training them to make money for the restitution, mm -hmm. you know, then that's another reason they might move to another prison. So if we had competition in prisons, ah, <laughs> I think we'd see a whole different kind of prison. Right. In fact, in a libertarian society or one that practiced non-aggression, you wouldn't have – I doubt you'd really have very many prisons because yeah. a person, if he was making restitution, why would you lock him up, right? right but exactly. if he didn't make restitution, then you'd put him in jail, and then he'd have to pay the costs of imprisonment too. Mm -hmm. Well, who's going to do that? Right, I mean, you'd right, have to right. be pretty <laughs> – you'd have to be uh, – yeah, you probably wouldn't be right in the head if you made that choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was basically um, thinking about recently that, um, you know, the, the state is, is one big broken window fallacy in that, you know, f funds must necessarily be diverted forcefully away from where they would have gone voluntarily. And so for that reason, you know, when um, green environmental type people complain about pollution, especially on like – Earth Day, you know, national <laughs> federal holiday, Earth Day, um, and how we have to take care of the planet more. And, and and I think the greatest polluter, not only the military, but just the state itself in the sense that it yes. must use force to divert those resources because they would not necessarily have gone there otherwise. They must use threats and intimidation. And to me, that's the that's the epitome of waste, right? That's mm -hmm. because you're actually in introducing violence into the into the equation in order to get well that that's right and it costs a lot of money too right. i mean if you think about it if you lived in a neighborhood where your neighbor was always stealing from you you'd have to spend a lot of money putting up steel doors and mm -hmm. bars on your windows maybe you'd have to hire somebody to patrol your property right. you know that costs money so you don't have any money to paint your house or make improvements on it or landscape it so you know the property would not be as attractive and and similarly when we get government to do our law enforcement uh you know there's a lot of waste it's it's about twice as expensive to have government do anything <laughs> than than it is to hire somebody from the private sector and i haven't even counted you know all the money that we spend for lobbyists and and Congress and we spend it because what happens is eventually we have to pay that tab somehow. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if special interests are getting a payoff, we end up picking it up in some form. Of course, either yeah. with yeah, either through inflation, higher prices, mm -hmm. lower wages. So I think this is something about the economy that it isn't really very well understood. I mean, most people don't understand economics and they don't understand where poverty comes from. Poverty today doesn't come from lack of resources or overpopulation. Poverty today comes from government. If you look at the history of the world, 
we lived on, we, meaning the human race, lived on about, you know, maybe uh, $2 uh, a day or something like that, a very low amount of money for most of the history. And then after the Industrial Revolution, there was a great, you know, surge in what we now call the developed countries to create wealth. Not in the third world, though. And the reason the third world didn't get wealthy wasn't because they had handicaps in terms of resources or too many people. What it was is they didn't have the freedom. And and one of the freedoms they didn't have was the freedom to start their own business. You know, John Stossel went to uh, Hong Kong, New York City, and India to try to open his Frisbee business. In <laughs> Hong Kong, it took him an afternoon. In New York, it took him weeks. Wow. But in India, it was going to take him five years with no guarantee that wow. he'd be able to do it. Yeah, so yeah. if you think about that, the poor in India can't wait five years to start you know, making enough money to support their family. Mm. So what do they do? They go into the underground economy where, of course, they make much less. And then they have to pay bribes to the government officials so that they don't end up getting thrown in jail. Mm. This is why the third world is poor. And they also don't have what we call clear title. You know, we were talking about the American West a little while ago. Once the settlers got out there and they marked their land and everyone agreed whose was what, they went down and registered it. And the government, when it came in, recognized that with clear title, what we call clear title or formal title. Hmm. That hasn't happened in a lot of the third world. As much as 80% of the land is still owned by government, it's hard to get clear title. And hmm. that's one of the projects that um, I'm excited that libertarians are actually doing. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I didn't share this with you earlier, but I'm chair of Liberty International, which used to be International Society for Individual Liberty. And, you know, one of the projects that we support is getting a GPS to Indian villages so they can go ahead and mark their property, take it and file it so that they can get clear title. And when they do that, now they can mortgage it, they can sell it. Before, they're just squatters, mm. <laughs> if you think about it. The world's poor are sitting on land that if they had formal title to, <laughs> they would actually be pretty well off. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really it's really an amazing thing when you think about it. That I think the um, the natural inclination for people is to thrive, is to produce and create. Right? It's not to yes. pillage and plunder and rob. Oh. Right? Most people, I think, are genuinely trying to earn a living, legitimately trying to raise their kids to be moral, decent, compassionate human beings, and for the most part. Um, they are being um, deceived and conned by those people in power um, that, you know, use the idea of the state as being, you know, their protector, their security blanket, right? You need us, you know, basically like it's like the uh, the um, the relationship of a um, of a battered wife and his husband. You know, where would you be without me? You know, nobody would love you, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's amazing how I guess it's kind of, kind of what Stockholm syndrome is, right? Where people feel they need the state, but in fact, it is their greatest, um, you know, destroyer, their greatest source of the greatest harm. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's why I'm, I'm delighted that you wrote these kind of books. So, yeah, so please, you already uh, discussed some of the topics in uh, Healing Our World. So, so yeah, please uh, explain why did you write it and uh, yeah, a little bit more about what's in it. Sure. Well, I had uh, been a libertarian and a candidate for many years, uh, but in the... In the mid-80s, I started reading about our foreign policy, which I hadn't really addressed very much. And all of a sudden, uh, it kind of, things fell into place. I was reading about our foreign policy and how it always backfired. And then I realized that that's because the ends and means are intimately related. And in our foreign policy, the means, of course, usually is taxation that we use to give to other people or actually what we end up doing is giving it to other governments that are not so um, freedom-minded <laughs> as our own even. Mm. And so what happens is they oppress their people with the money that we give them. And, and when I saw that, I saw, I saw a lot of things fall into place kind of in, the, in a moment. I guess you could say it was a, a moment of revelation, um, religious or not, depending on how you want to think about yeah. that. But I just, you know, it, it, it felt it was that strong, though, that I used that word, even though I'm, you know, I'm not a particularly, quote, religious person. I consider myself a spiritual person. But it just fell into place. 
um, that the, you know, any ends, ends that we want to get, that we use aggressive means to uh, try to accomplish backfires every time. So that was a big part of the non-aggression principle that was made clear to me. And, and then I also saw that the, I was, you know, raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school for all these years. So what I saw was this love of neighbor that we had been taught was actually in the political realm was basically the non-aggression principle. And, you know, had, I had enough background in church history to know that that's how, you know, Christ operated. He never forced anyone to give to the poor. He mm. asked, perhaps, but he didn't force. And so I saw that our Judeo-Christian uh, culture uh, dovetailed very nicely with the non-aggression principle as well. And then I also saw that the spiritual movement that was going on at the time, we called it the New Age Movement. Uh, really kind of fit in there too, except that many of the people involved in it were liberals because they didn't understand that the means they were using were creating ends that they didn't want. Mm. I'm happy to say that as time has has evolved, uh, there's a waking up in that community, I think, to a large extent, and and seeing that you can't use the means of war, basically, which is what aggression is, mm. and expect to come out with the ends of peace, right. the ends of harmony, or the ends of prosperity, because, of course, war is probably the most destructive thing that we do. And I'm not saying there aren't times when we need to defend ourselves, but I am saying that it's something to be avoided <laughs> if we can and only used as a last resort because it is so expensive uh, in terms of lives, in terms of just money, and, of course, in terms of peace of mind as well. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. You kind of remind me of um, of Dale Brown from the uh, Detroit Threat Management um, uh, Company. Have you heard about him? He, he, you know, the name's ringing a bell, Viper, but I'm not. Yeah, Viper's Threat Management Company. He's the one that has been gaining a lot of interest and attention in volunteers in libertarian circles because of his. He's he went into Detroit, or I guess he's been there for a while, but since Detroit. Um, just collapsed and the and you know a lot of people migrated out tax base fell you know the law enforcement people mm -hmm. just stopped <laughs> you know stopped yeah coming to people's aid that they said it's, a, it's a, like an hour response for you call 911 and so and so he 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 went in there and he um like like so, there were still some people living there still some businesses operating but they were getting a lot of robberies and theft mm -hmm. and in, in in you know home invasions occurring a lot of a lot of things like that and so he came in and he started um, being, you know, offering services as security and protection for these businesses, and 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 so they were prospering, so they were getting wealthier, so they were able to give him more money. He got he got better. He employed more people. He he expanded. He's teaching classes. He's and so he he's made a really good um, business model over there, and he, and he's spreading it, and it's beautiful. And I I interviewed him, and exactly what you said is that the way he describes success is if you can. Um, prevent or diffuse a tense situation by using just words, right? Psychological means rather than using force and violence and coercion um, because he's like, there is a level that he teaches to his employees. There's a level of failure that goes on. Like if you can't use words, you know, if you have to threaten them, that's first level of failure. You have to, you have to touch them. That's the second level. If you have to pin them down, third level, you know, hurt them, you know, go all the way down. You're failing mm -hmm. completely, you know. <laughs> so, so the ideal is to diffuse with just words, and I thought that was so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, it's the least expensive way to go. And, and, I, don't just, and I don't just mean in money, you know. I mean in psychology right. and time and resources and, and um, ill will that can come of those things. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it brings to mind, you know, the the whole um, idea that people are taught that World War II brought us out of the Great Depression, which uh, <laughs> which many people in, amazingly believe. And uh, and and when they tell me that, I'm like, I'm like, well, what you're literally telling me is that murder is good for the economy, right? This, <laughs> this is what you're telling me. Like, <laughs> you hear what you're saying right now. You know, when can destruction ever be a good thing, right? And and in, uh, in Henry, I remember in Henry Hazlitt's book. Uh, economics in one lesson he's like if if you you know destroy a window 
and that's good, then maybe destroy the entire house. Maybe that's better. Maybe destroy all the houses in the neighborhood. That's even <laughs> <Yeah>. better. <laughs> How far well, you? Doesn't, yeah, <laughs> doesn't make any sense, but it's part of the propaganda. And you know, that's you know, we're we're taught basically the opposite of what is good for us so that we when we vote when we think about this when we discuss it we end up actually putting the uh, I guess the handcuffs on ourselves if you want to think of it that way mm. and it's very sad because you know a lot of well-meaning people who think they're doing good things are actually causing a lot of harm and they don't realize it I, I had a woman come up to me after I gave a talk one time I was addressing the talk to liberals and that she was one and she came up to me afterwards. I was maybe in my forties at the time she was in her sixties and she said, you know, I've been all my life. I can see it now. I've been voting for exactly the, I've been voting to harm the very people I'm trying to help. And, uh, it was a very emotional moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, we were we were very close, and I I hugged her and I said, "Well, you've got the rest of your life to you know, now that you know what to do, to change that." And she was, and she said she would. She it was just we were both in tears. <laughs> but you know, even though that's a horrible thing to have to go through, in another sense, it's very um, it's very uplifting mm -hmm. because somehow when you see even when you see the quote, error of your ways. And of course, I was in that position too. I, I was lucky. I came to it early in my life, but in college, I'm going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not easy sometimes to realize that your beliefs are, um, they're not only wrong, but, you know, you've sort of been duped. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's good to know when you're questioning these things that, not only is there a light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel, there's quite a bit of uplift at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and that's what, when I was writing Healing, you know, having having had these kind of revelations, I was so excited. I, I mean, I was on fire. It took me five years to write it, and I, I spent virtually every weekend, every free moment. And I had a lot going on in my life, so I, I kept getting derailed. But, I mean, I was on fire. I always came back to it. And, you know, I think it's... That's the promise of really getting into this and understanding it. It does something inside of you that changes you in, a, in such a positive way, even if you never really do anything more with the information. Yeah, you remind me of a quote, uh, I forget who said it, um, that um, you know, the f fools have only answers and the, the wise have only questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so somebody who tells you that they know the answer of how society should be run and therefore we should force it on everyone else against their will, <laughs> it's like, you know what, <laughs> just walk, walk quietly the other way. Um, because, <laughs> you know, the idea, it's a fundamental idea I bring up with people is... Um, is good ideas do not require force. That's right. right? Basic, That's right. basic fundamental idea. If you, if whatever you're saying requires, um, you know, coercion to implement and impose those beliefs, then you got to re-examine your <laughs> your basic foundation of what you believe. And and it, you know, it's interesting what you tell me about the woman um, because. I think that um, she she felt so comfortable with t telling you that, I think because of, of maybe how you are and your demeanor and how you're so non-threatening, right? And, 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 and that's great. That's, that's a wonderful thing. People open up to that, you know, because it, the way some, some – I see some volunteers or anarchists talking to other people, it immediately provokes a negative reaction. The walls go up, and, and it doesn't matter how much logic, how much <clears> – <throat> um, how many principles, you know, how much, you know – well, well sounding words you give them or, or logic or reason, they're not going to get through because they've already <laughs> erected those barriers, right? Yes. Well, that part of the problem I think that we have as libertarians is once we realize that all this aggression is going on around us and at us, it's easy to get angry. It's easy to, you know, strike out. It's easy to tell people who believe in those things that they're wrong. And that they're part of the problem, and they're hurting us directly. And and that might be true to some extent, but we really need to get beyond that. And it's interesting. So if we want this free world, we need to be more loving. <laughs> 
you know, and, and that's something we haven't learned well as libertarians. So oh, yeah. it's kind of interesting the way the world works. If we really want, you know, to have a libertarian world then we have to learn about love. And that's what most of these other people think they're doing. They think they're being loving by voting for taxes for the poor and things mm. like this, not realizing it actually hurts them. And I could tell you stories because I, I worked with the poor for a long time. Mm. But the important thing, I think, and I'm glad you're bringing this up, is that we as libertarians need to you know, work through our anger on our own and dump it. Because if we approach somebody in an angry manner, they're just not going to listen. You know, we need to create a safe space for them to change their mind. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, who's going to do it? You know, who's going to create that safe space for them? And, you know, I mean, I used to think like a liberal. <laughs> so, hey, you know, I, I understand. I understand perfectly that, that you know, you could, it's easy to be wrong about these things. It's easy not to see what's there to be seen. What we're trying to do is help open people's eyes up. And what they're going to see is going to be pretty uh, scary. Just like you were talking earlier about the abused woman who doesn't see that her husband doesn't really love her because mm. if he did, he wouldn't do those things. Mm. And, and that's a scary concept for her because she she needs to believe that her husband loves her. Mm. You know, that's where she is. So if, if you just simply tell her that it's not enough, you know, you need to create that space of so she can self-examine and she can come to that conclusion. And that's as libertarians, that's what we need to do. We need to help people question all this propaganda that they've been given. Question the way taxes, which are ultimately theft, are turned into something good and helpful and something civilization can't live without. I mean, mm. you know, there's something around the emperor not having any clothes on here. <laughs> <laughs> and we just need to help people see that. You know, that's our job. And, and I think it's so, it's so wonderful that we have to learn to be more loving to do it because – that, I think, is another very important part of implementing libertarianism because think about it. If you're just out for yourself, even if you believe in libertarianism, if you can steal something from someone and not get caught, you know, there's a great temptation there to do it. But if you love people and you, you pick up a wallet off the street instead of saying, oh, I'll just take the money and stuff and, you know, mm -hmm. I won't use the credit cards, but I'll take the money and keep it. You know, no one will know. Uh, but if you love somebody, you can go, oh, my goodness, if I drop my wallet like this, I'd be so worried. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call this person, that, you know, that I see the driver's license. I'm going to find them and make sure they get this back. Yeah. I, I mean, if you love, that's what you do, you see. And and if you don't love, then you aren't going to be a good libertarian for very long because it's going to be so tempting <laughs> to hurt somebody and take their stuff when, you know, you're not going to get caught. You know, um, I, it doesn't often happen that I, uh, I, I cry on camera, but... <laughs> the way you just said that, I don't know. It just, just <laughs> I got, I got tears in my. Eyes. It's beautiful. It's very beautiful. You're right. It's, it's so true. And the other thing that that has to bring uh, that you, you, uh, you said about the woman that I realized is that what's important to understand or to re realize is that people um, act on good intentions most of the time. Like this liberal, right? She thought she was helping, right? So many yes, people do course. things they, with good intentions. Of course. It's so you know, and, and it's just it's just um, it's a lack of understanding of the means by which they are achieving those ends, and that's I think what we have to help them to realize slowly um, is that you know you, you know have to reiterate to them that you're good people, you have good intentions. I know you're decent, moral human beings. So now let's just take this a step further, and you know then you have to slowly understand what is politics, what is government, what is law, what are regulations, and uh, we can bridge that gap. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, make a yeah. mass conversion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it will happen because, you know, we all want we all want the same thing. We we like universal harmony and abundance. We want peace and plenty. Right. And you know, obviously, it's very obvious to libertarians and those who are enthralled with the non-aggression principle that, you know, you just can't get that from practicing aggression. And once we recognize that aggression is actually hurting us instead of helping us, it's like, you know, just our selfish instincts will kick in and say, yeah, we're not going to do this anymore. Mm. <laughs> so I really think that once that awakening occurs, and I think it actually has started, 
uh, it's actually the snowball is rolling is how I think of it. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's it's really wonderful because you know for many years I mean I got involved in this in college which you know for me was the late sixties and I really didn't see much action especially with the younger generations for many many years. It's just really recently since Ron Paul activated uh, the youth of the country that we've actually seen someone to pass the baton to. Mm. <laughs> And that is so exciting. And that's uh, the snowball is rolling. It's not just here in the U.S. It's international. Hmm. Uh, you know, students all over the globe are waking up. Yeah. And it's just going to change everything. I, I, I don't know that I'll live to see it all, but... Um, I'm I'm so excited. You know, it's like I, I feel like I feel like I've already seen it because, you know, like I said, the snowball's rolling. You know, it's it's mm. going to be very hard to stop. Yeah, you know, I'd like to tell people that um, that we are planting the seeds from which we will not necessarily enjoy the shade, but our grandkids, great grandkids, you know, they will enjoy it. So it, it's like, it's like the abolitionists in the 19th century that um you know opposed slavery changed slavery on moral grounds alone not because they knew how the cotton would be picked not because they foresaw the 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 uh, you know the creation of the massive industrial machines but because they opposed it on moral grounds alone and that's it and that was enough and maybe some of them did not live to see the abolition of slavery but that didn't matter right because they were just fulfilling um their you know their purpose their their um <laughs> you know their ambition of um they have this one goal and i think that's i think there's a lot of um parallels that can be drawn for through to abolitionism and, and a lot of i know a lot of volunteers call themselves abolitionists <laughs> yes yes that that's really a good way to put it and you know i'd like to just point one other thing out i know you're aware of it but just to reinforce it for your listeners um you know the the moral is the practical I mean, people say, oh, it's not, liber- liberty isn't practical. In fact, that's how we lost our liberty, I think. Mm-hmm. In the early 1900s, people said, oh, yeah, liberty is wonderful, but it, it doesn't help the poor. It doesn't save the environment, you know. But this is, <laughs> of course, a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. It's the moral that gives us the practical because how do we define morality? It's what, and you said it earlier, it's what makes humankind survive and thrive. Mm-hmm. And if if we're going to thrive, then we have to have liberty, and so, which essentially is the non-aggression principle. So that's what's, I think, one of the other parts of this revelation that I had was that the moral and the practical were two sides of the same coin. And at that time in the libertarian movement, you didn't talk about the practical aspects of liberty. You simply talked about the morality. Somehow, if you talked about the practical aspects, you were sort of selling out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think think that was... You know, just I, I think today it's recognized that that's just missing the the point. <laughs> mm. That the the moral and the practical are two sides of the same coins, and if they aren't, then your morality needs to be questioned. Hmm. Right, good point. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, we could talk a long time about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to mention before we change the subject to um to your book, I want to talk about the uh, the death by regulation. Um, you uh, talking about poverty. I don't know if you heard of this guy, Gret Glyer, and his Donor C app. Have you heard about it? No, I haven't heard about oh, that. At all. Oh, he's an but amazing, tell me about amazing that. kid. Twenty-four year old kid. I I heard about him first on the Tom Wood show. Um, I think it was like two months, maybe around two months ago. And then I heard this guy, and I'm like, I got to interview this guy, and I did. A fascinating guy. He made he made this app. He's a twenty yeah, four year old guy. He spent three years living in Malawi. Uh, after he graduated college in the United States, and he witnessed like true abject poverty, and it really deeply affected him. And so he 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 was like, "How can I help these people?" You know. And, and it, what's amazing is that you know he didn't like you know call his congressman or petition his congressman or vote <laughs> or vote to get you know more foreign aid. You know, he made this app that is basically uh, it's so much more efficient than the 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 bureaucratic charities that you know charities are pretty good, but it, it, you know, he was saying how really it's so obscure and muddy. Like you never really know where it's going. You never really feel like yeah. you have connection to the people that you're donating to. And so with this app, it's direct. Like you see pictures of people that need. Like there's an aid worker there, and they say this person needs this, maybe for a house, maybe for shoes, maybe for uh, a wheelchair, whatever, or or some kind of um, uh, operation. And and it's, they need this much money, and so you donate whatever you can. 
and then um, when the person reaches the goal, um, the 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 aid worker on the other side they take pictures and videos, and so they update you in real time exactly Neat. where the money's going. It's just fascinating, and so it's really gaining steam. And so I interviewed him, fascinating kid, twenty four year old kid. Can you imagine what, what, what was I doing at twenty four? I wasn't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so yeah, give him a lot of credit. Not necessarily a libertarian or volunteers, but but he's actually been embraced again by the libertarian volunteers community. And and I was talking to him a little about it about volunteerism, and he's like, yeah, I, I agree with all that. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> he's like, yeah, so awesome kid. <clears throat> but um, but yeah, so so let's let's talk about your um, your death by regulation uh, before we go. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. Well, you know, I. I... I've worked in the universities and in the pharmaceutical industry, so I know a lot about um, how we make drugs. And what happened is in 1962, there was a thalidomide tragedy. I don't know, uh, you, you, uh, you're too young to remember it, but when I was about 11 or 12 years old, Life magazine ran a series of pictures of European children uh, that had had no limbs or a few I'm sorry missing limbs and their mothers had taken thalidomide in pregnancy and you know this was the result and the company hadn't tested the drug in pregnant women and in fact it wasn't really appreciated back then that the fetus was so much more sensitive you know than the mother and so because of that in the United States, where this really didn't happen very much, there were a few samples given out, but it hadn't been FDA approved, um, they really beefed up the FDA. It used to take four years to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. Now it takes about 14. Hmm. So 10 years were added. And when I, was, I and others were working on AIDS drugs, the AIDS patients decided they couldn't wait. So what they did is they hired black market chemists to make the same drugs we were working on. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to put them in people, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them had already taken them and become resistant. So we had to wait for new, uh, new, new patients to be diagnosed, which, you know, was slow things down a little, but it wasn't, you know, at the end of the world. I mean, but the point was that the AIDS community basically said, hey, we're going to opt out of this FDA system. Well, cancer patients wanted to do the same thing, but they didn't want to, you know, go underground to do it. So they actually brought this issue to court. And they they were suing on the grounds that they had a right to life as guaranteed by the Constitution, so they should be able to take drugs that weren't approved by the FDA if their life was being threatened. Mm. And the courts ruled that Americans do not have that right. <laughs> so now what's happened is um, the Goldwater Institute has started passing what they call right to try state by state. And this law basically says that um, a person who's terminal can bypass the FDA, talk to the pharmaceutical company directly, and get a drug that's in testing. However, most companies aren't going to give out those drugs because the FDA has ways of punishing them. And so um, this is, but it's, it's, as you can see, there's a lot of momentum for patients to be able to take what they want, whether or not it's been FDA approved. And this is also true in the alternative medicine community. Um, this, these regulations that were passed in 62 actually have caused the premature death of about at least uh, the conservative estimate is 25% of the people who've died since 1962. By, by delaying, you know, by 10 years, uh, life-saving drugs, or some of them never even get to market. For example, I was working with prostaglandins and liver disease when I was at the Upjohn Company, and the FDA was so excited about, about it that the examiner called me personally, which generally isn't done <laughs> And said, Dr. Ruar, we understand you have a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease, and we want to make sure that your company puts this drug on the market. But the problem with new drugs is really new drugs, that you are know, breakthrough drugs. You don't know how much to give. You don't know how long you have to give it. 
you don't know how many patients you need in your study to get the statistical significance that the FDA wants. And for liver disease, the studies would go on for years, you know, and how do you measure it? Can you, do you have to take a piece of the liver every time to check? Is there some kind of blood parameter you can use? Um, you know, how, how firm does the proof have to be? And what the company realized is that even with the FDA basically telling us, hey, we're going to work with you on this one, um, if we guessed wrong on any of those things the first time, we wouldn't get the statistical significance that the FDA requires. They require two studies. And we'd have to start over. And by the time we actually got to market, our, our drug would have gone generic already. And I tell this story because it's a good example of how life-saving drugs don't even make it to market because of all this extra time and money that it costs. You know, a lot of people are concerned about the cost of drugs, but if you actually look at how much it costs the drug companies to um, just go through the FDA hoops, it increases exponentially. Hmm. And that's about 80% of the cost of our pharmaceuticals are due to regulations that don't don't help us but actually hurt us and that's pretty sad yeah 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 it's, it's, it's an interesting topic i'm uh, i'm an acupuncturist chinese herbalist um eastern nutritionist so i come at this from a you know very different perspective mm-hmm. um and you know i had a different view of um allopathic medicine when i was studying at that time and now uh that has uh transformed a little bit as well and you know i realized that um you know one of the things that really irritates me is that i don't really know what medicine well allopathic medicine would look like because it's so (laughs) heavily subsidized lobbied um you know all the regulations in place like what would it look like without the state i have no idea you know, and it would look very different, <laughs> it would, you know, and, and there would be so much more accountability and um, transparency. And oh, it just it just irritates me that I can't trust what's coming out of pharmaceutical companies because it's, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, it know, really actually, angers yeah, me. <laughs> well, drug companies actually were the first ones to synthesize uh, in large quantities vitamins so the and they were the first ones to put out uh, you know like one a day multiple vitamins Mm -hmm. they were actually pushing nutrition very early on but the problem is when these regulations kicked in and it took a while for them to kick in and they they increase every year because of the way they're shaped Mm -hmm. (laughs) so so what happens is that um that the FDA actually prevents people from knowing about, you know, really important effects of vitamins. For example, let's take folic acid. It prevents birth defects in children. Mm -hmm. Uh, It prevents spina bifida, and we knew about this in the early 80s. But the FDA told folic acid manufacturers, folic acid is a B vitamin, I forgot to say that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a nutrient, you know. So they, they told folic acid manufacturers if they even mentioned these studies that they would shut them down. The FDA would shut them down. Hmm. And then the Center for Disease Control, another agency of the government, started talking about how important it was for young women to take folic acid because you need it the first month or two of pregnancy when you don't know you're pregnant. Hmm. And the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they even mentioned the fact that the CDC was recommending this, that they would shut them down. Hmm. So it was many years before it was um, – you know, well understood that young women of childbearing age should be taking folic acid. So in the meantime, there were probably about, and it's hard to estimate exactly, but in the neighborhood of 25,000 uh, babies were either born with spina bifida or other crippling birth defects and had to be institutionalized or were aborted because you can check for this, you know, in utero. Mm-hmm. So it was a worse tragedy than the thalidomide tragedy we talked about earlier. There are about 10,000 Europeans affected. But here, probably over twice that were affected in the U.S., and I call that the American thalidomide tragedy. Mm -hmm. And it was occasioned by these regulations, which allowed the FDA basically to say that any vitamin or food that uh, the manufacturer claims will help keep people healthy <laughs> or prevent a disease is, is basically a drug and has to go through 
all these regulations is 14 years of, of studies. It's crazy. I mean, by that uh, definition, uh, bottled water sellers cannot claim that their product prevents dehydration. <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. It's simply ridiculous. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so um, I guess I'm, I'm. What I'm saying is that I think if, without these regulations, it would have been very, very different. Um, I think the pharmaceutical companies would have stayed more involved with the nutritional aspects of things. In fact, they do. They actually still manufacture because they can yeah. most of the bulk vitamins and things that uh, people take, and most people don't even know that. Yeah, yeah, they do. My father works actually in a. Um uh, pharmaceutical company is kind of actually closing down and and moving overseas. Interesting, you should mention regulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they're stealing our jobs. No. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, everything it always comes back to the state. You know, you you follow the you follow the breadcrumbs far enough. You know, it always comes back That's to the right. state. It does. It does. And you know, um, we've just been talking about drugs, but the entire healthcare industry, I would estimate, has about. An 80% markup, I mean, uh, how can I say it? Um, the regulations are causing us to pay, well, look at it another way, five times as much as we should be paying. Mm. So when you say healthcare is expensive today, you need to realize that without these regulations that increase the expense mm. and don't help us, mm -hmm. uh, we would pay about 20% and probably less, but I'm going to be conservative and say 20% of what we do today. And that makes it a lot more affordable for people. Now, Again, I said, you know, <laughs> that's a conservative estimate because if we were, we had a nation where it was easy to talk about things like nutritional supplements and that was part of our, uh, that was, you know, that, that people who were selling supplements could go to doctors and talk to them about them, which actually is against the law right now, um, you know, then they could go ahead and and really change the whole face of um, our health. And that's why I say we were robbed of a golden age of health. Most people don't see it because they don't see the regulations and how they're suppressing information. But, you know, being in the industry, it's something you do get to see. Yeah. Yeah. And it, um, you know, it brings to mind, uh, like, like for me as a, as an herbalist, one of the things that I appreciate being an herbalist is the fact that it's not regulated at all. Like you can go to Chinatown and get pretty much any Chinese herb you want in, in, in a, you know, an herbal shop and they'll give it to you, you know? And I mean, that's not to say that, um, you know, that you can't hurt yourself either. Like, cause there are some herbs that are pretty powerful, like pretty close to what an antibiotic function would be. And sure. so it's quite possible that you can hurt yourself. But, but again, there are a lot of people that are well-respected and very knowledgeable in this, and you can um, you know, seek their advice and, and different things. And so, and so, again, a lack of, of state regulation does not mean a lack of regulation, right? There's always going to be internal Well, the marketplace. Right, yeah, right, the internal market. the best regulator. Right, right, exactly. And, and the other thing that, that you brought to mind is the idea that um, in, in another reason that prices – uh, are pushed upward with healthcare is the fa is the licensing laws, and and, mm -hmm, and how that exactly. artificially reduces you know the number of people in in the field right and and so you know competition is less and so <laughs> and, that's right <laughs> exactly and and those are state regulations so you know it's kind of hard to actually quantify how much that hurts us, which right. is why I did it for the pharmaceutical industry. Since it's regulated nationally, it's much easier. And so I did before and after the 62 regulations, and that's where I focus. Because one of the things it's very hard to do sometimes is show that how much regulation actually hurts us and quantify that. And so this was a way of doing that. So that's why the numbers that I threw out as conservative estimates were based on all the multitude of studies that have been done around the FDA. There's been quite a few in the pharmaceutical industry. So in a way, we have a better basis to really get a feel for what an agency that is supposed to be protecting our lives actually does. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so before I, I studied all this stuff, I, um, you know, I used to w- like to watch a lot of documentaries, like um, Food Inc. and Food Matters, and you know, all these um, health and nutritional yeah. documentaries talk about that, as, and they talk about the pharmaceutical industry, you know, and all the, um, you know, the revolving door and and mm-hmm. the, uh, <laughs> you know, the regulatory capture that goes on. Um, and then, but it's funny at the end of most of those documentaries, it's like, you know, lobby your congressman and have them change the laws and, <laughs> or, you know, enact certain regulations here and there. Exactly. You know? <laughs> it needs to be done. Well, and that's one reason I'm writing this book. People don't understand. Uh, they don't understand the industry. And of course, the reason they don't is because most of them, most of the critics aren't talking to people in the industry and getting the scoop. And of course, if you think about it, Who's going to say anything? If you say anything and you're working for a company, you, your company can be punished mm. by the FDA. It, they can just drag their feet on your approvals. And of course, if you um, if you if you say as a pharmaceutical research scientist that hey, regulation is bad, it sounds like you're just sour graping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, who's mm-hmm. going to believe you? Mm-hmm. And that's why I think. You know, if I had, if I were still working in the industry, of course, I couldn't really do something like this. But I think it's important for people to understand this is where the wool has really been pulled over their eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I don't know if you heard of um, John Moody. He's the head. I think he's the chief um, um, executive uh, person in the the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Have you heard about him? No, he's a no. really, really awesome guy. I, I interviewed him as well. He's a he was a libertarian, and he so basically this fund um, helps protect small farmers who are engaged in like litigation battles by these big, um, you know, um, big companies like Monsanto that oh, yeah. uh, that you know mm-hmm. tend to attack them. Um, for various reasons, and so they, you know, they, and, and you know, they they don't have much, many, much funds to, you know, to uh, engage these these huge companies, but but you know, the companies do these, you know, Monsanto, they have limitless funds and you know, army of lawyers, and pro- and, and so it's amazing. So yeah, these people are doing really amazing work, and, and also he talks a lot about how. So you talk about it from the um, pharmaceutical perspective, and he talks about how the state. Uh, how the state affects him as a farmer, you know, especially, sure. especially, um, uh, um, you know, meat regulations. And so that's another fascinating aspect. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Well, and, and, you know, I'm very involved in the nutritional industry as well. I mean, one of the things back when, you know, I was working in the pharmaceutical industry, we didn't have all the genetic manipulation that we have today. Right. So we had to make our animals sick. Well, they weren't sick because we had titrated their chow with all these vitamins and minerals. <laughs> they just didn't get sick. So the only way we could make them sick so that we could test our drugs was to take away their vitamins. Uh, now, what does that tell you? Uh-huh. <laughs> it tells you if you optimize your you know, vitamins, uh, you can oftentimes prevent disease. Mm. Not always, but mm. oftentimes. Mm. And so... You know, that was, it was very interesting because the research scientists who had to do this were all taking supplements, exercising, keeping their weight down, not drinking. And uh, unfortunately, the MDs were smoking and uh, <laughs> were overweight because they weren't doing the work we were doing, which showed us, hey, you know, you got to pay attention to this stuff. Right, right. Beautiful. Well, well, um, I don't want to take any more of your time, Mary. Uh, you've been very generous. Uh, so please um, reiterate uh, your, the, you know, ways people can find you if they want to follow your work. Okay. Well, of course, going to my website and signing up for my um, mailing list is the best way, and that's at ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. And there you can find the link to my Facebook page as well and uh, you know we do more or less daily postings and also in my free library on my website you can get excerpts of my books short answers to the tough questions and healing our world the compassion of libertarianism and you can also get uh, an earlier version of healing our world the 93 version free so it's worth signing up and uh, certainly worth going there and at least checking out the free stuff <laughs> of course, Who, who's going to complain about free stuff, right? <laughs> right, right. So, and of course, you can you can buy. Uh, obviously, you can buy the books as well, but uh, and they're on Amazon as well. Right. Well, well if you're gonna 
you're going to buy the book, you're going to help be helping a, a wonderful person. So, um, so do everything you can to help her out. Um, another thing I like to ask some of my guests before we go is, uh, <coughs> uh, what is your favorite quote of all time? Oh, that's, that's, uh, I think right now I would say it was Margaret Mead's quote, you know, that basically says, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. Beautiful. <laughs> small, <laughs> small group of passionate. Uh, yes, dedicated. She said dedicated or something. Right, I don't. right. Dedicated, <laughs> passionate, independent minded. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how I that's how I characterize most libertarians, volunteers is that you know people like like me i do this podcast um you know I, I i get some donations but not like nothing not not anything to live by or to make my wife happy but <laughs> it's something and 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 so i i still do it though because i love to spread this message i i, I fell in love with this philosophy and you just want to spread it you know and uh <laughs> yes 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 i like we like we were talking about earlier how good you feel when you Kind of the light bulb goes off, you know, and you realize. And, you know, really, in a way, I guess it shouldn't be expected that we're going to make lots of money at this because I'm sure the abolitionists didn't either. Right. I mean, they probably put a lot of their life and liberty on the line. But, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you just do it at whatever level that you can. I mean, even talking to neighbors and things like this make a big difference. You know, people are... You can. It, it's amazing how much you, one person can can influence so many people. And I've been delighted because I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, you've changed your you, um, your book has changed my life, things like this. And of course, it's very inspiring. But most people don't get to hear that. And I guess I just want to encourage your listeners, you know, don't don't worry if you don't get that feedback because you know it's amazing. You, you'd be amazed if you could actually see all the steps <laughs> and and uh, the way it comes about that people's minds are changed it it really it really is pretty miraculous and since I've been privileged to see that in my own life I know it happens in everyone's life so you know I guess my message would be don't get discouraged realize that everything you do really yeah. is part of the solution Oh yeah, yeah. Beautifully said. I mean, I, I, one thing I like to tell people is um, live your life in such a way that the world will be poorer when you're gone. And <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's kind of um, the way I look at you know how I make friendships and new networks and connections with people is that you know you you don't you don't um, you know tell people how to live, but you you explain how you live and your principles and your philosophy and your morals and. If if that is attractive, other people will want to emulate you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and also ra raising your kids in a peaceful, compassionate, moral way, and you know basically prop, you know populating a, a new future, but in that way. But but also yeah, be the example. You know, you know, show people the way by your example, by your life, right? If you want to change mm -hmm. the world, first you look inward and you change yourself first, right? It's always no, oh, that's right. It always starts that's with, right. It, <laughs> it always starts with the individual. So, um, so yeah, wonderful conversation, uh, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through um, PayPal, uh, Bitcoin, or Patreon. Links are below. Patreon.com/slash/PeacefulAnarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar a show is all I ask for uh, interviewing fascinating people like Mary here, and I want to do more of it <laughs> because I love doing this. I love spreading the message. Um, it's so addicting. It's so fun. And uh, and it's a beautiful message to say the least. So uh, if you can help me out, please do so. Um, you know, even though these videos are free, there's an opportunity cost to everything we do. Right? We can always be doing something else. So um, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged. So uh, thank you very much, Mary. Wonderful conversation. Uh, really appreciate it. So this is uh, peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, and the Seeds of Liberty dot com, and the Conscious Resistance dot com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading 
the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.